I'm Mark Schuster, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I'd like to welcome you tonight on behalf of the Kennedy School Gay and Lesbian Association and the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. Our guest tonight is Barney Frank. Congressman Frank has represented the 4th District of Massachusetts in the U.S. House of Representatives since 1981. Prior to that, he served in the Massachusetts State House. He's also had a long affiliation with Harvard. He went to college here in the 60s and served as an IOP fellow in 1975. Tonight he returns to speak about gay rights, an area in which he has long been a vocal advocate. Please join me in welcoming Barney Frank back to the Kennedy School. Uh, 
um, they were cutting back on grants to the National Institute of Health. Among the things they weren't doing was putting adequate funding into aid, research. Uh, it was an extraordinary lack of understanding the problem. Not entirely caused, but compounded by the fact that AIDS was seen as a disease that only affected the unpopular group. The fact that AIDS affected uh, primarily, as the first half of the year, gay men and intravenous drug users contributed to the neglect. I don't, it wasn't caused, it wasn't that people in Washington, at least not very many, who committed it. Uh, I'm having my suspicions about the fact you can, but uh, <laughs> It wasn't people said, hey, good for them, let them all suffer from it. It was the, the, the natural reflex not to engage the federal government in trying to do this research, uh, which was compounded by the sense that we don't really much care about those people, but it's, uh, it's their own fault anyway. Um, Congress, in this case, took the lead first. On a bipartisan basis in Congress, to a certain extent, uh, the Democratic leadership of the House was, was supportive, and Senator Old White, a Republican, getting into the Senate. We worked pretty well on this. And we reached a point where Congress finally got AIDS funding to a level that I think was adequate. Uh, now, adequate is adequate, as I said before, if anyone heard it. Uh, you know, that, that's better than inadequate. On the other hand, if you should meet someone in a bar to whom you are attracted and you find out that he or she thinks you look adequate, then you're probably not going to be totally. <laughs> In the last Congress, this particular last one, AIDS research did get the second biggest jump in funding, or the one before this. Uh, that was a good bit of the my study that the money got the biggest was SDI. Uh, last year, I think AIDS passed SDI in the tennis period. And this year, AIDS will get another big increase, and SDI will be telling about where it is, which better approximates rational priorities. But I think we are at the point now where the federal government will be voting enough money so that most promising areas of aid research can be done. But there's still a lack. I was struck a month ago reading an article in the New York Times about aid research in Zaire, which they say one of the advantages that they find in Zaire is that they can keep track of people better doing longitudinal studies and other kinds of research because you can pay people so much less when they're doing research in Zaire that they can't afford to do some of the research in the United States. It's just disgraceful that we should be unable to do some research that makes sense in terms of keeping track of people uh, because these are the people who volunteer to get it. Uh, because they haven't got enough money. But we have broken through the regular administration's proposed legislation. Based on no one exempted uh, aid research from Grand Lebanon. When Grand Lebanon went through, aid research was cut, along with everything else, the first, uh, first cut that came. But Congress is finally, I think, ready to vote sufficient money for aid research. The next area is in dealing with the medical costs of people with AIDS. Here, uh, things are getting a little better as well. Henry Waxman, who is a very able and committed guy, chairs the appropriate subcommittee in the House. Senator Kennedy, who is taking over the Health Committee in the Senate, is good on this. One of the things you need is a lot more flexibility so that people with AIDS can get medical treatment without the kind of problems that they have to now go through. Most people are familiar with that. I've seen people trying to help people through that. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid have been much too difficult. I think by the end of this year, we will have made it a lot easier and a lot more flexible. The area where I don't think you can expect an adequate federal response, certainly not in the current administration, is in education. I've seen some forms of education that attempt to tell people how to avoid getting AIDS. Um, there's almost a direct correlation. The more effective the advertising is likely to be, the less likely uh, Edwin Meese and William Bennett are to approve it. Um, Edward Coop has been one of the pleasant surprises of uh, this decade. A lot of people who were uh, critical of him turned out to have been unfairly critical. But by the way, I think the medical profession in general has um, a pretty good record here. I should say, I'll jump ahead of myself a little bit. The right wing elements who wanted to use AIDS as a stick with which to beat back gay men and 
lesbians have been on the whole unsuccessful. One of the reasons has been that the medical profession has shown a great deal of integrity. I, uh, for the first time this year, or last year, put into the congressional record approvingly a document put out by the American Medical Association because they sponsored a friend of the court brief in the recent Supreme Court case which dealt with contagious diseases and handicap discrimination dealing directly with AIDS, which was excellent, making the point that the Justice Department's opinion on the subject was malicious nonsense. Uh, they didn't say that exactly, but that was <laughs> the uh, inescapable interest. Um, and Dr. Cooper has been very good, and he's talked, if Dr. Cooper were in charge of education, we have, I think, a reasonable program. Uh, but with Secretary of Education Bennett and Attorney General Meese in charge, you are unlikely to get out of this federal government education that is very useful. Um, they will counsel people to abstain from sex, and that will be the sum total of the education. And that undoubtedly should be part of an educational campaign. The council is unlikely to be, I think, as widely followed as they do. Um, in any case, that's all you're going to get. So, with regard to affirmative steps with regard to AIDS, I think we can expect increased federal funding and a better response with regard to medical treatment. I don't think you're going to see much in the way of education. The other area where it now turns out we will, we will see some affirmative action over the vehement objection to this administration is uh, that people with AIDS and probably people with the AIDS virus will be protected against job discrimination. Uh, the Justice Department issued an opinion last year that was issued by Mr. Cooper, who holds the position of uh, ATC's uh, uh, counsel to the Attorney General. It's, uh, he is in a very distinguished position. He holds the job that Chief Justice Rehnquist used to hold, and he holds it, in my judgment, with about the same degree of uh, compassion and commitment to decency and fair play and constitutional value. And uh, he wrote an opinion. Uh, we have a law, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which <coughs> prevents people from being discriminated against based on them having a handicap. Now, we have this problem just from the head of the Civil Rights Division, the man, William Bradford Reynolds. He sees his job as reading anti discrimination standards and then explaining how it is possible to discriminate despite that. What he does is he has opinions issued which give you explicit notification of what they will require before they prosecute anybody for discriminating. And it therefore becomes a map of how you can discriminate successfully. That suggested that they should change the name of the civil rights movement to the biggest licensing movement. Because their function is, in effect, to license the basic to give them a map about how to go ahead. Um, most of the time when the Supreme Court deals with them, they lose. They lost on affirmative action. Uh, the Civil Rights Division has a very low batting average with the Supreme Court. And uh, the 504 thing was not the Civil Rights Division alone, they obviously uh, had a partner. What Mr. Cooper said, and I think this is an example of about as, as uh, intellectually sleazy an operation that I've ever seen out of the, uh, out of the Justice Department. Um, they have been sleazier, they say they're not really sleazy. Being on the tape is much easier than, than, than this. But this. In the intellectual capacity, I think this is uh, best to show. Uh, what Mr. Cooper said was you may not fire someone because he or she has AIDS. However, you may fire someone not because that person has AIDS, but because you are afraid that that person will give AIDS to someone else, even if you are dead wrong about the possibility of contagion. Now, he said that as well. A wholly incorrect opinion that someone might give someone else AIDS. If you believe that people can get AIDS by um, being in the same room with someone else who has AIDS, if you think that AIDS germs are carried through the air by, uh, by uh, uh, breathing, not even heavy breathing, just <laughs> light breathing, then you can fire someone even though that is a hobby or only you. Now he cited, he, he said it is true in his opinion that the Center for Disease Control said that AIDS cannot be transmitted except by uh, blood or uh, the exchange of other bodily fluids. And um, 
At least, I mean, for some of us, I guess maybe everybody these days, things get repeated. Dr. Strange, though, has forever made it possible to utter the phrase bodily fluid, because I'm sure you don't think paranoid and demented. What the other phrase is. Um, the, uh, the, the footnote in there, they have a statement that says the CDC says that you can't uh, get this category, but it has been suggested that this is too, uh, this is a pure drug conclusion. Full semantic point about uh, politics. Be very weary of the passive voice. Politicians and other governments who are using the passive voice are saying something often that is uh, politically useful and stupid and offensive, and they don't want to be blamed for saying it, but they can't find anybody else to blame it on. So they use the passive voice. It has been suggested that you can get AIDS. Again. Nobody suggested it. They haven't appointed anybody who suggested it. Uh, he didn't suggest it. It has been suggested. Uh, I'll give you an example. I thought that that kind of, despite the patient pig, what George Bush said, this is a directly appointed by that uh, talking about Iran, the policy has failed the president. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, as the president sitting at his desk, and this policy just walks in and fails <laughs> He goes, he, goes back to East he goes back to East Wing and he says, geez, what a day the electricity went out and the policy failed. The last thing with, with this with Mr. Conte, it has been suggested. But well, he did have three footnotes for the it has been suggested. Um, all three of the doctors who were footnoted repudiated the use of the uh, footnote. Uh, that includes doctors Hazel Klein and Essex from uh, up here, and I forget who the third one was. The opinion was an awful, vicious thing. I don't think the demagogues on the right have been successful in using AIDS nearly as much as they would have liked to to beat back people interested in ending discrimination against gay men and lesbians. But that's no thanks to the Reagan administration in part. Dr. Cooper has been very admirable. But Cooper, on behalf of the Justice Department, unrepudiated, Cooper's report to Curtis Sales a little bit, but unrepudiated, not only instructed people on how they could go ahead and discriminate against people with AIDS, but try to undercut the notion that AIDS cannot be casually transmitted. And there is no greater threat, I think, to the civil liberties of gay men in particular. If it were to be erroneously rooted about that you can get AIDS uh, the way you get the flu from just being around somebody, the uh, kind of people who put forward published in 64 California, the Lelouch crazies in their allies, would have a great asset. And they put that in there. Fortunately, as I said, the three doctors repudiated what he said. Uh, Cooper admitted, by the way, in his opinion, that if you believe that sickle cell anemia was transmittable by casual means, you could fire people who had sickle cell trait, um, even if you, uh, you, you could refuse to hide them. That would, of course, legitimize substantial discrimination against a lot of black people. Uh, he admitted that was perfectly okay in his opinion. The Supreme Court basically said ridiculous. Uh, and that in fact, people being fired because they were sick was um, exactly uh, what the law was passed to protect you with. Now they didn't reach the issue so, you know, of whether or not you could be fired if you just had the virus and didn't have the illness. But all the reasoning and the opinion suggests that you will be protected. Because what they said was, the purpose of this law is to say what some of our far right friends think is terribly radical. Your right to a job depends on one thing and one thing only, your ability to do that job. Now, having the kind of contagious illness that can be transmitted, yeah, that would um, make you unsuitable if you had the wrong kind of illness. I mean, I, obviously, uh, if you had AIDS, you would not be employable as a sex surgeon, presumably. Uh, uh, you would not be a professional blood donor. Uh, if you have tuberculosis or something, in some ways you can't do it. No one is suggesting that you have to be hiring people who will give other people an illness. What the court said very sensibly is this law means that if somebody's ill, but the illness does not interfere with their ability to work, and transmitting it to innocent people is an interference, but if they're not going to transmit it to other people, or to guilty people, I suppose they're always innocent people, can't go to prison and give them the same illness, um, and then that's irrelevant. So that's what all that opinion says. Well, the regular administration was just awful on that subject. And uh, they were fortunate to repudiate that it's been great. I did get a chance to ask the transgender what he was going to do. He said they would take a look at that opinion. 
I told you you have to look hard because the people are drifted up so bad that you don't know what to look at. Um, but that's basically, I think, where we are uh, on the affirmative side of the maze. You are now likely to be protected if you haven't. The last point is a series of attacks that have been made um, to try and impose various forms of quarantine, mandatory, this and that. They peaked last week when Congressman Bill Dynamite um, and those who do not like the notion of AIDS being used as a pretext to restrict people's civil liberties should rejoice that Congressman Dannemeyer is in Congress because um, he is the one who always leads that charge. He's the one who's always been restricting. And uh, we have a tradition of not speaking out of our colleagues, so let me simply say that he is not one of the 430 most respected members of the House of Representatives. <laughs> <laughs> his being the uh, advocate, I mean, just be thankful that Disneyland and its environment sent him to Congress here uh, every two years. Because if somebody has to do it, he's the best one. He proposed last week <laughs> that anybody who was going into a homeless shelter, which was receiving any federal assistance, which is virtually every homeless shelter, who was going to get any medical care, must submit to an AIDS test. Now, I said, I want to be there when a 60 year old homeless woman uh, who was unfortunately mentally ill and already thinks that the mafia is coming to her fillings. <laughs> Well, I would count of people like that. When you explain to her that uh, before she can get a band-aid for her cut, she has to take an AIDS test. Um, and most people think that was the It was overwhelmingly computed. Uh, the House of Representatives defeated three to one. Democratic and Republican representatives, conservative and liberals, speaking against it. And so far, the efforts by people like Mr. Stanemar, Senator Helms, to use AIDS as a pretext or to try and do things with regard to AIDS that would be abusive of people's individual rights have worked. They haven't worked in part because people understand that it's the worst possible way to deal with AIDS and medical problems. Dynamite gets up and says, oh, we don't want to, you want to treat AIDS as a civil liberties problem, it should be a public health problem. But Evan Coop understands, as well as everybody else is, that in a free society, unless you take into account the rights of the individuals, you're not going to have an effective public health response. Because if people, if the regular division has weight, and if, if you had the virus, you could be fired, you could be quarantined, you could be subjected to all those kinds of abuses, they would be giving people an absolute incentive not to cooperate with any screening program. Uh, to the extent that we want to do more involving people's participation in helping solve the disease, protecting the victims from further victimization is essential, and most people recognize that. So we have got, uh, so far, uh, Success in it. It's a constant effort because people are politicians worry about misinterpretation. They'll say, yeah, you're right, but what's going to be a guy that's got a 30 second commercial and say, oh, he voted not to uh, test people for AIDS? LaRouche also did us a favor by putting that referendum on the ballot in California, which got defeated 71%, 29%. Congressman Danmar announced the people of California uh, did not understand it, uh, were, were misled, etc. Uh, everybody moves the referendum. Uh, the uh, ignorance, temporary ignorance of the voters. But uh, that helped. Uh, so, so far we've been able to, to, to deal with that. Unfortunately, the Reagan administration, we've been able to keep Congress from doing that. Congress has not passed any of those restrictive things. It's taken a lot of work, but it's happened. The medical profession has been helpful. The Reagan administration, on the other hand, has been implementing some very uh, unfortunate aspects. In particular, they have a rule now that says if you have the age virus and you're in the foreign service, you may not serve overseas. Well, by the way, if you're in the Foreign Service and you can't serve overseas, <laughs> you're a career prospect, I need not tell. I think this way is not terrific. Um, uh, you know, it's like being a jockey who's allergic to horses. Uh, <laughs> not a lot you can do. Um, and the notion is that, uh, one, they said there won't be, uh, there might be medical emergencies and people won't be able to be treated, so you can't serve overseas. Uh, that is, you know, God forbid somebody with the virus should be in France, where everyone knows there is no adequate medical treatment available. <laughs> uh, of course, AIDS, having the virus, is not something that's likely to bring on instantaneous crises. It is a very unfortunate thing. The Grand Legal Defense Fund and the American Federation government employees are bringing a lawsuit against that. Uh, the Job Corps, Chuck and Brock, the gentleman, but a good guy, says, no, you can't be in the residential Job Corps program if you have the virus. And he said he's afraid that the people with the virus might have sex with each other and affect each other, at least 
in, I said, well, I said to him, uh, I was surprised that he thought that would happen because he could just do what Secretary Bennett recommended and urge these kids to abstain from sex. <laughs> and uh, we were in a private meeting, and I won't repeat his evaluation of Secretary Bennett's advice in that subject, but uh, uh, he was not sold on it. <laughs> <laughs> what he's saying is, I'm going to exclude anybody who has a virus from being in the residential quality job program. Um, I, unfortunately, those kids who excluded, whatever they were doing, this is probably an intravenous drug user population, but like, it's not going to stop them from uh, doing whatever they want to do, it's just that they won't be getting responsibility. Well, that's enough on AIDS, I think. Uh, it, it's an essential thing. Obviously, AIDS is not a disease only that affects gay people by any means, it never was, and it's become even less so. And it's clearly not the whole of gay rights, but it is something which kind of uh, deals with the whole situation. The, the fundamental point I want to emphasize again, though, is that the federal response to AIDS is very terrible, has gotten better. And the negative potential of people to use AIDS as a means of destroying gay and lesbian rights has really not worked very well, either in Washington or elsewhere. I think that's. Uh, uh, and encouraging sign about the sophistication of the graduate and of the uh, politicians and also about the medical profession. Now let me talk about all the other uh, subjects that come up. Uh, the first thing I want to say is to give the, the, the general impression I have about what elected officials think about uh, discrimination against pleasure and game, and that is basically the issue. Well, I'm a strong supporter of affirmative action in many areas. People have not been advocating affirmative action in the area of discrimination against gay men and lesbians. It hasn't seemed to be useful. Most people have just felt, in terms of the experience, if there were no discrimination, uh, if, if discrimination were barred, there would probably not be a need for affirmative action. If there should be, people would be exempt then. It does not seem at this point to be a need. Um, what people are talking about is simply the absence of discrimination. Now, discrimination takes several forms. Um, most egregiously, there is one place in the federal law where there is blatant discrimination, that's in the immigration law. We have a bill that was passed uh, twice, once in 1950, once in 1952. They, they passed it, I did so much, they passed it again. Harry Truman viewed it at both times. He was overridden. Um, it's the McCarran-Walter Act. Uh, Pat McCarran was a senator of Nevada who was a, uh, a, a predecessor and uh, ideological buddy of Joseph McCarthy. Pat McCarran was a Democrat, uh, uh, but that did not appear to affect his behavior in a favorable way in any way that I can see. And um, <laughs> they put in a, the worst drafted piece of legislation I've ever seen. It was 33 separate grounds of excluding people from the United States. Now, this is accretive. If you look at it, you see the intellectual history of America, this is one of the grounds of excluding is of anarchists. I mean, it is still against the law for anarchists to come to America. It is very good that the Congress has been for many years determined that no one would again assassinate William McKinley. <laughs> uh, others of the law have to do with people's private sexual behavior, uh, and what we do is we exclude people whose sexual behavior we disapprove of, um, even if they only think about it, and it's legal where they come from. I mean, specifically, technical law ground 11, no one who practices or advocates polygamy may be allowed in the United States. Now, I have asked them if they're going to keep this law on the books and enforce it against anybody, how come members of the Saudi Arabian royal family can periodically come to the Ritz Carlton Hotel and go to uh, Mass General Hospital or elsewhere to be, uh, to be up at night because my understanding is that polygamy is legal, practiced, and advocated uh, in Saudi Arabia. And I don't think we're going to keep people out on that basis, but we're going to keep people out for some parts of the law, we should do it for everybody. Uh, among the parts of that law is the exclusion of gay men and lesbians. Now, delicacy often governs uh, in statutes. In fact, in Massachusetts, as you know, um, private consent and sex became legal because of the delicacy of 19th century dress people. Uh, I should say, there's no need to say dress people, they were dressed. And women were not allowed to dress anything in the 19th century. Uh, they, they were men who were laws. And they talked about, they, they uh, made sex act illegal, but they did not want to be even remotely explicit about what it was that they were making illegal. So they talked about unnatural acts and uh, abominable and detestable crimes against nature. Uh, those are the words of the statute. And finally, when I went to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, they said, you know, these days, 
uh, an unnatural act, uh, it's not clear to people what's an unnatural act. It's in the 19th century, everybody might, might have a consensus on what was an unnatural act. Um, today, we don't think there is, and therefore this law is unconstitutional because it's too vague. Uh, well, the people who did the immigration law did the same thing. Actually, it was probably true, technically, for a while in Massachusetts, that um, heterosexual sex between unmarried people was illegal and homosexual sex was, was legal because the Supreme Court struck down that law on the ground of its vagueness, the state Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, the heterosexual part was really quite explicit. And it was only the uh, homosexual part that were vague. So there was probably a discrimination in that extent in our law. The wonderful case that the uh, first case of the Balthazar case, which I recommend, was a, a man who uh, grabbed a woman and at night point forced her to commit oral sex. And uh, um, in, I think, the most supreme example of the male ego I've ever read about, he then asked her if she wanted to do it again next week. <laughs> confident that once she had been coached, she would have decided it was a good idea. And she, with a remarkable friend of mine, said yes, made a date with him, showed up with the police, <laughs> and he came. And uh, he got arrested. And when they went to court, uh, he pled that uh, he should not be convicted of, of this. Uh, he was charged with unnatural act and oral sex because he said the state shouldn't involve itself in consenting uh, sex. And the, the former Justice Bravo, since I was a law school professor, said, in, in, in essence, you know, if it wasn't for the knife, that wouldn't be a bad argument. It's so hard to put a knife to someone's go and claim that you had uh, the state's interference with your consenting sex. But they said, he's gone and he goes to jail as he comes. He well should have. But they said, in the future, we just want to tell you that we don't like this unnatural act thing, and we're not going to practice to anybody. And the next day, they came up um, uh, over the objection of the judge saying, to do the Elmo, who was the case, uh, they threw it out. But anyway, the immigration law, they, they had the old delicacy. It originally said that uh, uh, people with psychopathic personalities would be excluded. Now, psychopathic personality was apparently understood by everybody at the time to be a polite way to say homosexual. Um, what is interesting, I think it's important to, to note that things have changed for the better. There were still serious problems. There were degrees of discrimination, this outrageous law is still on the book. But I think a little perspective about, in 1965, somebody brought a lawsuit. Somebody was excluded from the uh, United States on the grounds that he had a psychopathic personality, and he was homosexual. And he said, I don't have a psychopathic personality, so this must not mean me. And the Congress was afraid that the Supreme Court was going to say, yeah, you, you know, he's not a psychopath, he's a homosexual, it's not the same thing, he stayed. Um, so Congress, when it was liberalizing the immigration law, this is in the mid-60s, when Congress in 1965 did away with the old quotas from the 20s, when this great liberal immigration law came, there was apparent unanimity, I looked at the record, I can't find anybody who reported it, they unanimously decided to tighten up the NHA exclusion. It's 20 years ago. Uh, nobody, uh, took the floor to say, hey, this is wrong. Maybe there was some private conversations. Maybe people thought it wasn't, wasn't worthwhile. It's interesting to know that that just happened almost without anybody complaining about it. Uh, Congress tightened up the anti-gay exclusion. They need to worry because the Supreme Court upheld the notion that psychopathic person only meant homosexuals. In 1965, again, we were talking about probably the most liberal period in the United States Supreme Court. We were talking about the Supreme Court that included Arthur Goldberg, William Brennan, uh, Black, Douglas, Warren. I don't know exactly how everybody voted, but there was not even a coach to a majority the other way. So I do think it's interesting to know that in, in, in 1965, a very liberal Congress, the one that had been elected in 1964, Lyndon Johnson, the liberal Supreme Court, said, oh yeah, sure, and we keep our homosexuals, and they are psychopaths, but just in case anybody think they are, we'll make it more explicit. So they had sexual deviation, getting closer to explicit to but not quite there. Um, that's not all the books. If you are a lesbian or gay man, you are to be excluded. I got a bill in that would repeal that. Uh, I'm talking about the Reagan administration. They are on record as being in favor of its repeal. The uh, Center for Disease Control testified that way, and I'm told the administration, that's the administration's position. Uh, Senator Simpson, the deputy minority leader of the Republican in the Senate, says he also agrees that it should be repealed. That'll be voted on this year. Um, it's an example of how they complicate things. If it were not for the AIDS crisis, I would be optimistic that we can get that repeal. I am afraid that people will use the AIDS crisis in a way that will make that repeal less likely. Now, as a practical matter, 
America is not an importer of AIDS. Sadly, to our country, uh, we have had worse experience for than elsewhere, so it's just not realistic to think about America as an importer. And there is a separate provision in the law that says if you have a dangerous, contagious disease, you cannot come in, and AIDS would fit into that category. So people with AIDS would full blown AIDS wouldn't come in. But uh, we will have uh, a fight about that. We have a very serious chance of getting that repealed. And uh, I think that is important, not simply because it, it has a negative effect, but it's, it, it's got a very important symbolic argument. But it is, it's a national statement that uh, gay men and lesbians are undesirable citizens. And then while the country may be stuck with those that are born here, it can at least keep out any new ones. Um, it is not widely enforced. The current administration stopped enforcing it altogether. The Reagan administration backed off a little, but their position basically now is um, they will not exclude anyone uh, unless he or she announces that uh, he or she is gay or um, They will not ask anymore. And under the immigration law that we passed last year, by the way, which allows people who've been here for a certain number of years illegally to legalize their status, I wasn't able to get that total repeal, but we did get for the first time that's now covered by a waiver. Gay men and lesbians who are otherwise eligible for legalization who are known to be gay or lesbians in the immigration service can be waived in uh, on humanitarian ground. Uh, the committee report said it should be used in a little more general fashion. And I believe that the immigration service in the first place is not going to ask people their sexuality. And in those cases where their sexuality is known, they will be waived in. And there is one category like that. It has to do with the Mariolitos from Cuba. When Castro uh, allows people to leave Mario, um, Fidel Castro is in many areas unlikely ever to get an award from the and among his repressive uh, tendencies, apparently, is a homophobia. And uh, among the people who were expelled from Mariel as undesirable to Mariel were gay men. Now, the problem is that many of them apparently volunteered that they were gay when they landed here because otherwise people would have thought they were criminals. They, they, there were two categories in this several groups that were criminals and they were gay, so they volunteered they were gay. Uh, some of them have been unable to get admitted because the immigration service has an effect that they're gay. Now, under the current administration, they wouldn't allow it. The Reagan administration doesn't ask, so a lot of gay people come in, but if, if it's on the record, they won't, uh, they won't deal with it. I believe that what will happen is that when the legalization period comes, those people will be deemed to have entered illegally since they were gay, and then they will be waived in. So, and that's a, a deal we've been working on the immigration service. That's just one of those intriguing documents ever saw. Um, they were using a form in which they asked people if they were homosexual. They don't use it anymore. But if it's the first question where this is to a Cuban who's English who's met to met. So the first question is, are you a homosexual? She said, no. Did you understand that homosexual was seen the form uh, as it was filled out? Do you understand that homosexual is someone who has sex with a person of his own sex? The answer, yes. Uh, have you ever had sexual relations with a person of your own sex? The answer, no, I've been fooling around, but I've never had a real relation. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the margin it says, uh, answer with two hundred advice of counsel. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, that was enough, so he couldn't get legal. He couldn't get in. Then he will, I believe, be admitted under the uh, under the legalization. So, um, but that's I think going to be a very important issue for this year. It's been complicated by age, but uh, it, it will go forward, and, I, and, and it will be a very real uh, uh, indication. At, the other uh, federal levels, there was for the first time a hearing on violence against gay men and lesbians before the, the Judiciary Subcommittee. Uh, the interesting thing was the way the right wing behaved. They said it was, they ignored it. Ten years ago, there would have been a lot of opposition to it. This year, a hearing was held by Congressman John Conyers on violence. And the cause of that hearing, by the way, the, uh, the highest ranking uniformed police officer in New York City, the Chief of Department, who called to the Commissioner, Robert Johnson, uh, who walked in with four stars on each shoulder and a Bright red face and uh, a general demeanor that looked like he came off the sound set at, at, uh, at, at Hill Street. He just looked perfectly the part of the Chief of the Department of New York. Made a very forceful statement about the importance of having openly gay and lesbian police officers on the grounds that you cannot adequately police any area if you don't represent And that the police force that has no representatives of any significant segment of the community will be as good a police force as it could And uh, what's interesting is that you don't get the negative on this. Now, there is not going to be a federal gay civil rights bill. On the other hand, as I said, there has not been the negative that you might have expected from the uh, um, AIDS crisis. And I think, uh, let me 
sort of bring this to a close with this, and I won't be good at responding to questions and comments. I think what's important to understand is, is the attitude of uh, most elected officials. I think the major obstacle to prompter federal action to remove discrimination so people can be judged on the ground, that is the thrust of this whole radical movement, that people will be judged whether it's for immigration or jobs or anything else based uh, on, on the merits of human beings, the purely private decision will be not purely private. The problem we got is cultural land. If you had a secret ballot on the question of immigration, that any gay exclusion would be repealed by two and a half to one. One of the most conservative members of Congress, I approached him about this a couple years ago when we were dealing with under the legalization thing, and they asked him to vote with me to repeal. And the any gay exclusion is only one of them, by the way. They, it, it, it keeps out people basically whose opinions Ed Meese and George Schultz don't like. Um, you know, Ed Meese, of course, doesn't like a lot of people's opinions, and it's a Pierre uh, Trudeau who should be kept out of the country. I was going to ask, they have a list of people, the, the, the lookout books, where if you show up to be, uh, this is for business, if they look and see if you're in the lookout book, they won't let you in. Like Farley Moat was an author, he was kept out because they said he was dangerous, he threatened, he, he said he didn't like the SST, and he said he was going to shoot down an American uh, military SST with a 22. <laughs> and on that basis, uh, they decided to exclude him from, uh, uh, from America. Uh, Hortensia Allende, the widow of uh, Salto Allende. They, they use it in a very abusive political way. And I would want to ask, is there any way once you're in the lookout book to get out? And the only surefire way we have found is to become the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, and that's the only way to get out of it. Probably the only way to stay out of it in the first place when you should be in is to become the President of Austria. That's the same issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to this one. But the I approached this very conservative member and said, Can you give me a vote to do these exclusions? I said, You know, one of the issues is the homosexuality thing. He said, No, oh, Ronnie, uh, it's frustrating. I know that. But I'm afraid to go back to blank and vote that way. Let me know when it's coming up, and I won't be here. And I won't be my proxy. Um, very few members agree that there ought to be discrimination against people based on their sexuality. Very few people think that the federal government ought to, or any government, ought to prevent people from engaging. Let me just throw in one other point, which I've forgotten. That's the uh, Supreme Court case of Hardwick and Bowers, um, which tragically was lost five to four, uh, especially because, and I think do know what to be taken, of the intellectual and moral cowardice of Lewis Powell, Justice Powell, who had originally voted he admits to strike the Georgia statute, and then switched, and he wrote the most garbagey opinion in which he said, well, he didn't think it should be declared unconstitutional. He just didn't think anybody should ever be convicted of it. Uh, and if you read his concurring opinion, uh, and he suggested that it, it, it maybe it was okay to have it on the books, but that if anybody was convicted of it, you might be uh, let out on the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. But it was just, it was just intellectual and moral cowards that you're in the United States. Um, but people are understand that five to four vote is better than two people. And I don't think that kind of actually argument that progress is being made uh, in dealing with with, with, with bigotry for those of us who, who were fighting it. Because the last time a case like that came up, they only get two votes even to take it. It's a matter of opinion. Uh, they only get two votes, they couldn't even get it uh, for the vote. Uh, we had five votes at one point, we went back to four when uh, Powell choked. But um, uh, it was still better than we've been. But what was striking to me was the national reaction to that. The national reaction was overwhelmingly to condemn it. Uh, you know, I don't know if you ever listened to Jerry Williams, uh, who has not on whole been uh, identified with video talk show most years. He's not been the most pro gay of video talk shows. But he had a kind of fun. I happened to be listening one day shortly after Hollywood, and he was polling people on whether they uh, commit sodomy regularly. And once he explained to people what it was, they all giggled and said, oh, sure. <laughs> the Supreme Court opinion was largely ridiculed. Uh, and I think it was a striking point. And what we have is this. Most members of Congress, they have shown by votes. And I think it's very important because there was a lot of fear that AIDS was going to be, be the, uh, that AIDS was going to cause depression. In some cases, because people who were not themselves bigoted were going to be so frightened by AIDS that they would act professively. And that others who were bigoted would use AIDS as a professor. I think Congressman Danamar, as you mentioned, objected to being uh, uh, called homophobic. We were debating it. 
and they had the civil division said something about homeschooling stuff, specifically a book shop she met him. And he said that he thought that, that she should be careful that she did not become a rexophobe. And I, he then explained that a rexophobe was someone who had a fear of normal. I did not know why I wanted to confess. I have never find a dictionary, but um, I, a rexophobe was someone who probably feared normal. It is not someone who fears pain. Uh, but I, I said in Denmark, <laughs> I said in Denmark, since I was spending most of my time debating him, I didn't have any particular fear of the normal because I so rarely even counted it. He, uh, he, he and people like you were very much on the defensive, they were very frustrated. Uh, there was, I think, a reasonable fear three years ago that AIDS would be, that not only would, would, would efforts to end discrimination be brushed away, but that you would see people uh, uh, being repressed, that they would use it as an excuse to quarantine, etc., uh, gay men in particular. It just hasn't happened. There has been very little repression. This Reagan administration has done a couple of these bad things, I mean. But by and large, there has not been any of that. And in fact, the New York City ordinance went through. Uh, we are going to do better on immigration. Last year, we got that waiver through on, on legalization. Gay people will be waived into the country, and I was afraid there might be right wing pressure. I talked to Senate attention. The administration will stand by it. They will not use it in a, in a restricted way. It still ought to be uh, repealed. Uh, we did have one case, by the way, of a man who was actually tried to perjure because he denied he was a psychopathic personality. And he was, uh, we got a, a subcommittee in the House passed a bill with a gay man who was about to be deported. The subcommittee in the House passed a bill to keep him here. And, uh, uh, and in fact, we then got from the Immigration Service, uh, he asked for something, which I thought was sort of interesting name in the context he got, but it was only a multiple re-entry permit. He didn't even know it was probably licensed, but he got it on. And um, uh, he is now uh, okay. So things have done better. The question is why. And I think it is reasonable that, that there has been much less repression and some continued victory. Discrimination and bigotry against gay men and lesbians is in less good shape legally today than it was 10 years ago. That doesn't mean it's at an acceptable level. There's still a lot that already done. But there has not been the repression and there has been some, there have been some advances. Uh, part of it has to do with the organizing of the gay and lesbian community. Uh, this has been a, a uh, a self-help effort that has been very, very significant in two ways. First of all, people in the gay and lesbian communities have been smart and active and sensible. Secondly, just by being active, uh, people have discovered a lot of prejudice. Uh, people who encounter people, I mean, what you've got are many politicians now, especially people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, who up until 10 years ago had never met anybody who identified himself or herself as a homosexual, and the only image they had of, of gay men and lesbians were of, of stereotypical characters from, uh, from, from, from bad movies or even from good movies. And so for the first time they have met flesh and blood human beings who were like them in every relevant respect except what everybody went off and did privately. And that's, that's helped to dispel the prejudice and it's been very, very helpful. I remember when I was in the legislature the first time in the mid-70s there was to be a gay lobbying day at the state house. And I was nervous. I filed the gay rights bill and I wasn't sure how it was going to work out. And I was wrong to be skeptical. The simple fact for a lot of my colleagues in lecture, they met gay people for the first time who were self identified and not behaving in a kind of a, a self hating way, and that had a very, very real impact. So part of it has been that. Part of it has been just a general uh, improvement of the public. And we're at the point now, I think, where we have the, where, where, where we are close to dispelling the prejudices in a, in a significant way. I will say, obviously, AIDS, an AIDS cure is greatly to be desired for its own sake. But one of the additional side benefits of an age cure will be some of the remaining explicit homophobes and bigots have put so much on AIDS that if and when that cure comes, and AIDS is a disease which no longer is so overwhelmingly likely to be fatal, and that's going to knock the props out of the remaining bigotry. They have overweighted that case. I think we, at that point, will make great strides in things like the immigration law and, and elsewhere. And I think what you have is this. The overwhelming majority of members of the House of Representatives, I suspect those senators too, would vote the way everybody here, or also everybody here, would want them to vote if uh, it was a secret ballot. Overwhelmingly, members of the House and members of the Senate would vote to repeal the immigration law, not to allow discrimination against people based on their sexual orientation, not to 
restrict people's private sex access. The House of Representatives did veto the uh, District of Columbia ordinance, which said people could not have uh, uh, could not have private consent of sex. The fight was led by Dan Crane of Illinois, who was later censured for having had sex with Page. A little bit of the District of Columbia, so he wasn't being totally hypocritical. Um, I think it, I, I suggest to my colleagues, one rule people want to adopt is don't vote for any law you don't obey. I mean, no one expects politicians that vote to obey every law, but you should not be too particularly an advocate of law you don't obey. And I, I, I decided to complete my own record in that regard. I vote, I'm voting for the 65 mile an hour speed on the with that, with that thing, I'll be perfect. <laughs> on that, on that um, But uh, what you have is most members would vote the right way. They are afraid to, because they are afraid of political trouble if they vote. The, the, the critical difference between winning and losing on most of these gay rights issues at the federal level, and I suspect in most state legislatures, there are many state legislatures as well, are the members who would like to vote in a, against discrimination but are afraid to. Um, I think there's something from cultural web. There have been some very good analyses on regression analysis, uh, about which virtually every member of this audience knows more than I. So I think <laughs> there's you know, a method by which you can uh, try and single out which factors have what influence. Regression analysis, you, you can do when it shows an individual's position on gay rights is very, very, very unlikely to affect him or her electorally. It just has a much different. If you take all the liberals from you know, who, who previously won by 53 percent, and then there was voting gay rights. The ones who voted one way, the ones who voted the other. It just doesn't show up as a statistical factor. And people are starting to learn that that you can sponsor and vote for uh, gay rights bills and survive. We had a very important one last year. Where the District of Columbia passed a bill to say you couldn't discriminate in life insurance against people with the virus, the AIDS virus. And Congressman Danamar tried to get the House to kill that, as we have a right to do. And we had a roll call vote in the House in which we decided not to kill it. Well, it was a procedural thing. It was a motion to have the committee of the whole rise before he could offer his motion, but everybody knew what it was. Right wingers then used that, as they had a right to, because that's what it was, as a vote on whether or not you should be allowed to deny insurance to people with AIDS. And they went after a lot of Democrats who voted that way. No one who voted for that, not only did no one who voted for that lose, no one who voted for that felt any negative. Some of the Democrats who won Senate seats in 1986 were people who had voted with us not to cancel the District of Columbia. Thank you. The Democrats who won Republican Senate seats, Democrats who beat incumbent Republican senators who had voted one way on this and the Democrats voted the other way. It just isn't a factor. And one of the important things is to get people to know that. And it's very important for those who want to lobby on gay rights. It's very hard to lobby someone to change his or her deeply held conviction. That rarely happens. But lobbying on gay rights is very different. What's the job of people lobbying on gay rights is, is very literally to give people the courage of their convictions. Most people, there are enough votes for a majority, and every other somebody I'm familiar with, to have the right thing done if people feel that they can get away with it. And so, one is just to show them statistically that you don't lose for voting for, uh, for gay rights, and that you don't lose for voting the sensible position on age. Again, because the medical profession, the public health people, have helped us establish the point that it's not a case today have a conflict between a sensible public health approach and an individual rights approach. And given the nature of our society, respecting the rights of individuals is the best and most effective way to mobilize people and participate in the public health approach. Um, so those, those things have gone together. One is to let people know that. The other thing is, a lot of politicians say, okay, but I don't want to vote that way. And some people come to know, some people already know. They say, why is this guy worried? The politicians say, I don't want to vote that way. Why? Well, it's because we put it in and the answer will be, well, you're not going to lose. Do not underestimate the extent to which a primary can spoil you some. And I think that's an important <laughs> fact that people have to take into account. You have policies, you couldn't possibly lose, but what they will say is, hey, all right, but if I vote that way, some crazy right wing son of a bitch is going to come out of the woodwork and run against me, and I'm going to have to raise dolls, and who the hell wants to put up with that? And I want to go to the beach. And, you know, just one little thing. Any politician who tells you how much he or she likes the campaign is either a liar or a psychopath. <laughs> there is no way 
a sensible human being can like standing on a street corner at 7 o'clock in the morning, repeating his name 800 times, to be more go to work and wish we would leave him the hell home. <laughs> That's not a sensible way to live your life. So, but then one possible exception, I suppose, is Ed Koch. He's doing that. <laughs> I will have political grief, even if I won't lose. Which then means that in addition to kind of getting the people who want to do the right thing and reinforcing them, people who are going to go the wrong way, or no, they might get political grief, but more important, the people who are going to go the right way, you know, okay, there may be some guy who'll jump in against you, but there'll be people to help you. The existence of the Human Rights Campaign Fund is very, very important. It's packed, it gives candidates who are supportive of gay rights, and there are a lot of locals that are coming up. It becomes, it's just an important thing where you you don't necessarily need it, at least feel, you know, oh, I'm taking all this grief, at least somebody appreciates it. Politicians have enormous egos, uh, are always feeling unjustifiably underappreciated. They're always whining about, oh, no, they really appreciate everything I do, etc., etc. And, and, and stroking egos is a very important part of it. Um, having a human rights campaign fund is important. One prominent member of Congress who was very active on the subcommittee this Monday said to me, uh, a good friend of mine, and I've lobbied him for AIDS funding, he's been very responsive. He said to me about uh, August of last year, I don't think he had any opposition. But he said, hey, those AIDS people, they got any money? <laughs> and so he meant, I said, yeah, why? Well, he's not going to fund it. I said, all right, the Human Rights Campaign Fund bought a couple of tickets. And he was very grateful, and that was helpful. Um, the lobbying effort is not one of, of dealing with a, a fair kind of figures out there. There were some, but they were small. There are a large number of people who are ready to do the right thing if they can be. Uh, reassured. So let me just wrap this up and then we'll throw it open for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, to summarize that, AIDS has been, in addition to being a terrible thing in and of itself, a retardant in efforts to combat discrimination, but not nearly as much of a retardant as many people fear. It has not been the cause of new repression. Although there's always the potential for people to you know, what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. I mean, it could always happen. There's still people out there. But so far, the Lelouch initiative was defeated. And we're very lucky that it was Lelouch who did it. Because wherever else this comes up, now, it's going to be the whole that's like Lelouch. And, you know, they started. And, and that can be, can be tried out. But we're at a point where even with AIDS and the effort to combat AIDS, I think further progress can be made in combating any gang and discrimination. You are certainly better off if you are a gay person trying to get into the United States as a visitor or an immigrant today than you would have been 15 years ago. I think you'll be even much better off three years from now. And if the age thing is ever dissolved, totally better off. And I think, that there were, by the way, I should have one other thing. It's now official policy of the United States government, except in the military services, that being gay is not, per se, grounds for losing your security guards. Now, there was a danger here, obviously, of appearing to be excessively grateful for the diminution of an impression that shouldn't have existed in the first place. I understand that. I'm not saying this is anything anybody ought to be especially grateful for, but people ought to take note that the Reagan administration's policy on security clearances for gay people is a lot more liberal than the Johnson administration policy, or the Kennedy administration policy. John Macy just died, he's been head of the Civil Rights Commission, Civil Service Commission, under Kennedy and Johnson. And he took the position at the time, under the last time the liberals in this party, Kennedy had a Democratic, uh, the Democratic Party had an army. He took the position in the 60s that homosexuals were not fit for government service at all. Couldn't have a homosexual terrorist. Um, and uh, he just died, and people noted that. Uh, today, the regular administration <laughs> says that uh, you can be gay and work for the CIA. You can be gay and be a civilian in the Defense Department. They're not going to do what it is much, but, uh, and, and so you can be gay and work in the security of so, so, so progress. Uh, uh, gets made. You're still, if you were gay, you automatically kicked out of the military. And one of the most vicious and homophobic opinions ever written was recently written by Ju Judge Robert Bork of the District of Columbia uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, who uh, might be a big nominee in the Court, but he's just terrible on this. He's the one who distinguished himself by being one of the five market ball cops when neither uh, Ali Richardson uh, nor anybody else would. He was the third level guy. But things are getting better. Uh, and I think they will uh, continue to. I, I, there is on the part of, I have run into very few high elected officials who do not now think, oh yeah, this any gay stuff is wrong. 
The problem is this, it's a cultural way. I think politicians perceive the public to be less sophisticated than the public is. And I think the, 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 one of the main tasks for people lobbying on getting that advice in the next few years is to have the public understanding be communicated better to the politician. Uh, I think it, 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 it's so far failing for a long. Let me throw this up at this point. How we going to respond to any uh, questions? Drug availability until we were sure it was safe. America has 
I am told, among the strictest laws in the world, a drug must be proven non-toxic as well as effective. Going back to Dr. Kelsey and the thalidomide scandal. Well, it seems to me that is somewhat been placed with regard to an illness which is almost certainly fatal. Very few side effects are worth the death. And to have people not be able to get a drug that may avert death, or at least put it off for a long time because of side effects, is not a good idea. And the very least ought to be made to the individual. But that's right now where we are. There is right now one of the big policy issues is to what extent should you make an exception for AIDS drugs from the general federal policy of uh, holding off until you're sure about toxicity? And uh, I am for relaxation there. That's one that's being uh, very much wrestled with right now. And that one is a federal one at the moment. That's exclusively a federal one. Yeah. Congressman Frank, uh, he didn't want to step on your applause, and, and I just want to reassure you that you're not underappreciated, so no, no, we're not in that group. Thank you. Um, I have an observation, I guess. I'm going to get the cosmetic surgery anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I have a cousin. Um, <laughs> uh, an observation and then, and then a question, really, I guess. The observation is that you pointed out quite helpfully for us that um, Congress people can vote their consciences. They're usually ahead of where they, their constituents are usually ahead of where they think they are. And therefore, they won't suffer uh, effects, uh, negative effects in the election. And I guess- In this area, that's not a universal thing, but in the area of gay rights. Yeah, and I think you could go even further because of uh, what's happened with Congressman Studs and say that a congressman can even be openly gay and not suffer terribly adverse reactions at the polls. You, um, you said at the beginning of your talk in talking about police officers that having openly gay lesbian police officers would be a desirable goal. And later on you said that you can't police people if you don't represent them. I think that was something that the police official from New York said. I'm not beyond the age of the police force anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think that some people, uh, some gay and lesbian people would say, in fact, that they can't be uh, well represented if some gay and lesbian people don't represent them. Now, you can quibble over that. And in fact, you can even say that uh, an individual representative's personal sexual orientation is not a matter for public discussion or public record. And I think many people in this room would agree with you about that, too, although there might be some arguments. The question comes when an individual representative's sexual orientation is made a public issue against their judgment or whatever. Um, do you think that when this does become an issue, that evading a direct answer to that issue is a disservice to gay, gay and lesbian pride, really? I'm trying to think of a way we made a direct answer to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit of disturbed. I think it would be it would be much better if uh, people felt free to, uh, to to come out more freely. Absolutely, and it's a subject which I have uh, given a lot of thought to. Uh, and uh, there's no question. Uh, actually, I suppose you, it's all circular. If we were in a position where there were no costs to people coming out, there wouldn't be any need for it. It wouldn't be an issue. It's like, you know, when you reach that point, then uh, uh, there is a development. As we have recently become in this country, I think we have modeled that, and that is religion. Uh, and I think we have got to the point where uh, religion is virtually a non-issue. I think I've seen that happen in, in, in my own tradition. Being Jewish, I think, for me, was more of a negative uh, when I first started political, now I don't think it's much of a factor at all. And uh, I look at, uh, uh, for instance, in Congress, uh, the uh, pattern of Jewish representatives and senators. Uh, and 40 years ago, Jews were underrepresented statistically. Uh, that is no longer the opposite. There are now more Jews in, in the House and Senate than the strict numbers would, uh, would, would uh, suggest. And at some point, it just became like uh, with regard to people being gay, that's people are in a transition period right now. And uh, it is clearly much more survivable than people thought. But uh, we're not quite there. But to answer your question, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, would be, it would be better for uh, the cause, you know, if uh, people don't fear to come out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. What are your thoughts about the uh, the use of federal or state money or city money in the case of the soliciting or recruiting gay and lesbian uh, people for roles as policemen or firemen? Do you think there is a a problem with that uh, legally or ethically? Well, federal money, you don't have much, but I. I, I don't understand what the problem would well, be. There's Maybe. talk that Mayor Flynn may, may yeah. go out and recruit openly, and does that cause a problem for other groups? Uh, no, not at all. First place, I think when you talk about the police force, the police force don't know what you need. Society as a whole has an interest in the police force being as representative as possible. Let me go back and give, I think, Grace is a very uh, direct result today. I would work for Mayor White in the 60s, late 60s, and uh, early 70s. And this city suffered because it had a disproportionately white police force. I will tell you there were times when the high-ranking police officials wished to God they had more black police officers because there were racial problems and there were places when a black police officer would be, from the standpoint of public safety, leave aside any notion you have about equity or anything else, a black police officer would have been a hell of a lot better than, than a white police officer. And being a man sent in the mix would be. I think that's also true with regard to uh, any discrete segment of the, of, of, of the population. So I think it's very much a good interest. And what you decide is in people's interest, I don't understand why, uh, if you decide there was a need to have a better police force, why it, it would be a problem to spend public money. I mean, all police forces are all about public money. I mean, everything you do with the police force is public money. So if you decide something is a good idea for the police force, I don't understand how, what, I guess I don't even understand what would the ethical problem be in spending city money to get the kind of police force the city uh, thought it had. What if the city thought it ought to have more Asian police officers, as it has, and, and it's better off because it does. Or if it's because it didn't have enough, you might have it in, in a big enough city geographically, you might decide to need more people from a particular section of the city, uh, and you would do more recruiting in the one place than the other. Or you might decide to need more female police officers. But I, I think all of those are only within. Well, that was my point. Would it discriminate against other groups, whether Asians or blacks, or would there be a, a legal problem in doing so? No, because money has been used to. I mean, are you not aware that money has been used to recruit black uh, agents and other groups? Right. That's what I was asking. If you thought well, the answer is if, if, if you were to use city money in the city of Boston or anywhere else, I'm going to tell you that If you were going to use city money in Boston to try and recruit gay and lesbian police officers, you would be following the pattern of using city money to recruit black police officers, Asian police officers, Hispanic police officers, female police officers. Uh, that's, that's a more predictable. College graduate police officers. There was a period, particularly in the late 60s and early 70s, one of the discrete elements of the population where you had to boss were students. The students in, in, in the late 60s were, from the standpoint of those big cities, you know, pain in the ass. And um, uh, one of the things people wanted was looking to have more uh, college graduate police officers. Now, I think uh, trying to get a, a police department that represents the population that's being policed is a very sensible use. Yeah. Congressman Frank, I sit on the board of Regional Health Planning Authority. In fact, it serves your history, which is a five, no borrow. And we are basically out of business because of lack of federal funding. Do you think there's any chance that the uh, rising turn about age will help refund the health plan authorities? Unfortunately, not directly, because there are other, you know, ideological objections people have, people in the medical profession and elsewhere. Uh, I think that's probably going to take, uh, in the first place, getting rid of Graham Rudman. You know, if people vote for Graham Rudman, it's not possible. Graham Rudman requires cuts. And secondly, probably getting rid of the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration is ideologically opposed to uh, health care. So I don't think you're going to see a direct uh, relationship there. Yeah. Redquist 
and Scalia, and most of the time out of Justice White. Uh, the longer Wither White lives, the more it seems like the better figures of John Kennedy's second reason to say. On the other hand, you have in Blackman, I thought Justice Blackman's opinion in his dissent in Harvard was superb. And, and you know, you, you talk about the power of dissent, and Holmes's and Brandeis's and, and uh, uh, some of the uh, facts in the area of uh, civil liberties. Uh, I think we will all see soon uh, Harry Blackman's dissent being hailed as a prime example of a first rate piece of judicial foresight becoming adopted by the majority. So I think things are going to get better. Well, I take it back. You can't. We, there's a balance now, and it's going to be 50 50. I mean, it's shown by the Harper case. Powell did this. He voted originally one way and then the other. If a conviction came up, if you read Powell's opinion, that conviction will be dismissed. Powell says he would not sustain a conviction. So that if a, some state actually were to convict someone of an act of gay sex and send it up there, I, you, if you read Powell's opinion, you got a 5 and 4 uh, to overturn it. As to the future, there's one big question. Who's going to win the 1988 election? If Robert Dole or George Bush or Jack Kemp win the 1988 election, then things will probably get worse. And if any of the Democratic nominees win, it will probably get better. And I wish I didn't have to make part of the remarks about this issue, because I would like it to be not an issue anymore. But the fact is, with a couple of exceptions, I've been from all and this is, I suppose I should have been more explicit about this. One of the things that is a problem for gay men like this is the right to move the Republican Party. And you know, any party in which Pat Robertson is a serious political figure, Pat Robertson, Pat Robertson is a wacko. <laughs> neck and neck with George Bush for the most votes in the Republican <laughs> convention in Michigan. And a party in which this fool, uh, <laughs> and, and often a malign fool, is a political force, is going to go to Congress. So um, I think it really has not to become somewhat uh, uh, a part of that way. And uh, so it really depends on who wins the next election. As far as going to Congress is concerned, uh, what aspects uh, you said about the money? I hope so. I uh, I haven't given up trying to influence on this. I think I would want to talk with him. I, I would say I, I think he's, he's dead wrong on the foster care issue and does not fully understand the extent to which he is being deeply offensive to gay men and women by suggesting that they are because of their sexual orientation, less good foster parents. I, there are elements there that make some sense, but I think they are entirely simple. That is, yeah, everything else being equal, a two-parent family, where one parent works and one parent stays home all the time, and where you have previous parenting experience, is the best, is better, everything else being equal. But I think Harry ain't taking in that many kids anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, not there. And that's irrelevant to their sexual orientation. In fact, if you do, however, say statistically, I prefer a two parent family, one parent working full time, one parent staying home, previous parent experience, statistically, that will underrepresent gay men and lesbians. That's a fact. I don't think that's objectionable. I think where everybody thinks equal as you get. In fact, people in the foster care area tell me you don't have that many families like that. And, um, once you go beyond looking at those factors, saying yes, two parent family is better than one parent family, uh, one parent full time available to do child care is better than not, siblings is better than not siblings. Um, once you go beyond that and then say, and whether or not the gay husband, then you're in a big And I'm hoping that he can be persuaded that he should separate out. I mean, to some extent, you might say that being gay husband is a rough statistical indicator of certain other things. But we need to rely on rough statistical indicators, and you never should, where there's an element of bigotry. But in this case, you don't even have a tough choice because you don't need to use them as a rough statistical indicator. You have the exact facts before you. You don't have to estimate. One parent, two parent, working, non-working, whatever. That's all it ought to be. And whether or not people are gay or lesbian is irrelevant. I hope he can be brought to understand it. It will be a very... I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed that he hasn't been able to understand that yet. And uh, I think people should still work on that. Yeah? Do you think that uh, gay and lesbian civil rights will come to the point where lesbian and gay unions and marriages will be recognized by insurance companies, IRS, courts? That'll probably be the last thing that happens.
that is probably because marriage in our society is more committed to the charge of traditionalists and conservative religious institutions than just about anything else. Um, and uh, that kind of equality is going to take some time. One thing I think to do is, well, I think you can separate that out again. Uh, and obviously, you know, total equality is desirable, but until you get there, I think what you can do is to say that some of the things that are now available only if you are legally married should be decoupled, right? Not the best choice of words. <laughs> should be separated from, 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 uh, from, from marriage. That is, some of these things ought to be available whether or not you're married. I've got a bill in to give head of household status to single people for tax purposes, income tax purposes. Um, I think the thing to do is to try and find other, to, to separate those from the status of, of marriage wherever possible now. Uh, the rights to contract, those are all easy. The tough one may be with regard to health benefits, and you just need to have some evidentiary standards there. But I think you can work those out. People would have to show, you know, sharing common living quarters and having been together for some time. Um, that's going to be the, that'll be the last one to come again, I think, just because it is such a uh, good thing. And also, if you look at trends in the society, maybe that uh, uh, gay people and lesbians will be allowed to get married just when all straight people decide they don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Human Rights Campaign is the National Political Action Committee that raises money and distributes them to federal candidates for uh, uh, Congress. I guess it will maybe the presidency next time, but Congress is where it counts both House and Senate. And it's very important, very useful. I've had a number of my colleagues. Uh, they also have a good lobbying guy. Vic Bezos is a very bright guy, and uh, is part of a group of people who do good lobbying, who meet with sympathetic members of Congress, and uh, does an excellent job. Uh, it's strengthened my ability to lobby. I have been the conveyor of checks to some of my colleagues uh, from the HRCM to say thanks for the help to critical people. It does an excellent job. They have very good political methods, and it, it is useful. And it's probably, you know, I want you to ask for an opportunity to find the whole notion of private financing. It's not, people don't buy votes. It's not that correct. As a matter of fact, votes do not follow money. Money follows votes. People don't vote a certain way because they get contributions. People get contributions because of how they vote. But it's still a distorting factor. And you know, we are the only people, I can figure, in the whole world who are supposed to take large amounts of money from strangers on a regular basis and do nothing in return for it. <laughs> and that's, that's not doing it. Uh, so, but as long as we've got that, it's important to have a human rights campaign fund. Because one of the things the human rights campaign fund does is to say to these guys, hey, gay men and lesbians are, except for the way in which they enjoy sex, like everybody else. And like everybody else, they give you money if you're good on their issue, and, and, and uh, may oppose you and give you a phone if you're not. It's a way to say, hey, we're all part of the game. And it's, it's just very important in that sense, as a, as an opinion. And it's very helpful in that sense. It's helpful to get people to stop thinking of Homosexuality is something apart, and just as you know, another uh, group in this society that is, like other groups, like everybody else in some things, and not like other people, and having general interests and separate interests, so I think they are enormously useful. Yes? You've been talking mainly about federal and local government. Do you think the religious communities could be doing more? There's an awful lot of denial going on in the Catholic clergy, the Jewish community has been mainly silent. How do you feel about it? Well, I'm reminded of what Pierre Sandler once said when they were having this freeze in the Kennedy administration to have people walk 50 miles in 24 hours. Bobby Kennedy did it, and a lot of the people were doing it. And they asked Pierre Salinger, who was known as Pucky Pierre, to the press court, if he was going to do that. And he said, listen, I may be Pucky, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> and um, uh, I am prepared to deal with all these issues. As far as commenting on the very religious groups, the first place, I'm not fully totally qualified to do it. I think people ought primarily fights about religions ought to be conducted within the religions. And I do think that it is most effective when members of a particular religious denomination have something critical to say that they say rather than outside. I don't think it's particularly helpful when outsiders uh, uh, say it. Um, religion has historically not been very humane on this issue. There have been some uh, exceptions. Some religious leaders have worked at it better than others. 
but the other is I'm not overall qualified to talk about it. And uh, I do think that where criticisms are to be made and changes to be made, they come best from within. When people who are not part of a particular religious communion start making criticisms, I think you can have a, 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 a counterproductive effect in the gun. I have my church here in the house, and uh, this far right fundamentalist group, both Christian voice, gave me a zero. And I was asked to comment, and I said, well, I, I never said I was, so I thought there was no misrepresentation, because when Father John is home, he also got the zero, I guess I thought. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I think Father Biden was better able to criticize their pseudo Christianity, right? And so I, I, I think that is best left to people. Yeah. Uh, how would you make the trade off between, in some cases, there is a clear trade off between civil liberties and um, what some people are saying, seeing as good public health policy, and then uh, for example, uh, some people as not good but using passes to escape that heaven? <laughs> Well, in general, I am opposed to public health measures that interfere with people's voluntary choice. I just tell you, before I answer that, I voted to repeal the seatbelt law. I voted when I was in the legislature against the mandatory helmet law. I am very much opposed to banning cigarette advertising. Um, and I think you have to make a distinction. No one, now, if you, I would say we, we, we all want to be embarrassed, those of us in public life and all citizens, that people can go to prison and have to fear being raped. In fact, it is a disgrace the extent to which we send people to prison and then fail to protect them physically. Uh, a prison system in which the physically strong terrorize those weak themselves is an outrage. And that would be the rate. And that's what public policy ought to be doing. But as to voluntary sex, no, I don't think you have a right as a citizen to expect the society to protect you from the consequences of your voluntary sex. <coughs> what we ought to do, for people who are prison and anywhere else, prison you could say, by the way, you ought to act as if anybody you're having sex with could be a carrier of AIDS unless you absolutely know the contrary. And that's what we'll be telling you. That just assume that anybody you are having sex with is capable of transmitting AIDS to you. And therefore, have the kind of sex, if you decide to have sex, which is your decision, that is not going to result in you getting AIDS. So, I mean, since no one is involuntarily, I just hope, going to have sex with somebody else, then I don't think there's a problem. Uh, I, I really, I mean, again, it has to do with how it's transmitted. Now, if you could get AIDS from sleeping in the same room as someone else who had AIDS, that people who have AIDS could not be allowed to sleep in the same room with other people. Uh, if, if, if it were contagious and infectious in that way, you don't allow it. But I, I think what the public health responsibility is to explain to people how you get AIDS. And then say, therefore, you now know how to protect yourself. And, 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 uh, and don't, don't go. Yes, John. Do you think, Brian, that there's any prospects in the view in your future for any federal action on anti-gay violence? No, because there isn't much federal action on violence in general. Again, that's one of the things I meant to talk about when I talked about federal. I, we had hearings on any gay violence, um, but there isn't much. Uh, the prevention of violence is basically a state issue. In our history, the states have been in charge of preventing violence, the federal government has been in charge of committing it. A lot of people, in the general uh, distinction. So I don't think you're going to see, I don't think it's worth a lot of energy on I think it is useful to, the hearings were helpful. It's very helpful to have the chief of the show. By the way, again, one of the things that's striking is there are not people coming out and defending any gay discrimination anymore than they used to. And the immigration bill, uh, so far they've kept quiet. Don't come out of the woodwork, but they haven't yet. They didn't come and denounce. The, no, nobody said, oh, chief, we can't have gay and lesbian cops. That doesn't mean they're all going to vote for it, but they don't want to say, uh, say no to it. But, Given the fact that violence has historically not been a federal issue, and no, most racial violence is not federal, it's only exceptional. And, I, and, and race, given the slavery and the Civil War, race is clearly a typical, but, but um, violence against women is not a uh, federal crime. Violence against women based on them being women. Violence against the handicapped, you know, uh, 
Uh, and, and I don't think he was even said to make for gay people, because a, there was a strong and principled tradition against involving the federal government more in, in, in uh, uh, law enforcement matters. By the way, one of the things we've some conservatives who said was, well, look, we're for gay rights, uh, and there's a, a gay, basically, Republican group, and some of the members have said, well, we're for gay rights, but we can't support a gay civil rights bill because we're not for a racial civil rights bill. We don't think anybody should be prevented from discriminating against anybody. Um, some people believe that's a chill, but some is a die. That's one of the advantages of the immigration measure on the repression issue, because there is no libertarian justification for an exclusion of gay people. In other words, conservatives who say, hey, I just don't want the government involved, all the more reasons that would be on our side of this one, because what we're saying is, who sleeps with whom is simply none of the federal government's business. And so the libertarian argument ought to reinforce that. And uh, that's why I think the immigration bill gives us uh, a goal. I think we are running out of our